morning, everybody. Hope all of you guys are doing well on this nice and gloomy days. By the way, I love days like this. Should be some days that we should be at home cozy enough, right? And not have to be at work, but we are here. I'm glad to see all of you guys. We'll get started. We're uh, doing our presentation on running reports that work for you. And we'll get started. Um, next slide, please, Sandra. For me on sponsored research executive dashboard, um, I will be talking about this uh, dashboard. Um, we also know it as uh, the dashboard in my reports. This gives you um, information about your research projects at the, uh, the president college unit level, as well as variety of ways to pull the data to fit your needs. Information uh, shown is by proposal submitted, project uh, awarded, research expenditures, and f &A cost recovery. Next slide, please. How to access my reports. Access is based on the security roles. It's granted by the BAR, which is the BAR uh, Banner uh, Authorization Request. The Department General Inquiry, which is basic role, is required for Banner Finance. Be very Oh, and we're recording. Um, it's gonna be a, a high level uh, presentation on um, f and And um, what we are going to um, kind of cover is gonna be very focused on how we develop the rate as an institution and then how we apply it in on a proposal um, and kind of where the rules come from as it relates to that. Um, I've got an agenda slide here. Oh, and so we will get started. Oh, can you see my presentation? There we go. Did it switch now? Excellent. All right. So the, um, the agenda is that we're, go as I mentioned, cost overview. I've also found a really helpful Coger and other national organization developed f and explainer video that I wanna share with you. Um, we'll also touch on the regulations and policy. And then um, kind of more on the practical side, we'll, we'll, we will be talking about how OSP ensures that we're applying the right rate and give you some additional information and considerations that we, can, we should also make in uh, applying f and so um, I did. I did want to just make it clear. This is going to be covering F and A as it relates to defining costs and the application. What we will not be covering is anything related to distribution. And um, I think that um, as as Dr. Fisher mentioned earlier, this is again a kind of a precursor, very high level, get, getting you started on understanding F and A. But if you have questions that kind of go into that level of depth, that would be something that you would refer to uh, OVPR. So you can find their contact information by visiting their website. And if you have those burning questions, I would encourage you to send them there. All right, so moving on. Um, just to kind of get you familiar, there's a lot of language that we have kind of associated with um, indirect costs, but um, these classifications actually come from the, um, the uniform guidance. So uniform guidance is our governance. We'll get into that a little bit more later, um, but we have two kind of separations or classifications of costs. We have direct costs. And those are costs that can really be specifically identified to a particular cost objective um, or really, you know, identified to what the project might need. Um, separate from that, you've got indirect costs that are really about infrastructure um, and additional administrative support. So um, we have these two different classifications and basically um, as a higher education institution, because we're a higher education institution, UG tells us we have two major components that go into our indirect cost classification. That's facilities and administration. And we'll go a little bit further into that um, a few minutes. So if we wanna to continue to succeed and grow, we need to develop those skills and knowledge and competencies that is gonna help that growth happen. And we look at development um, for the purpose of this as 
building the capabilities of people who are meeting or exceeding job expectations um, to ensure success in their current role and prepare them for those future opportunities. And those future opportunities, especially within research, can be being part of new projects, being part of new initiatives, um, taking on exciting roles within those. And it's a shared responsibility. It's not, development's not just about coaching people to improve performance. It's, sometimes we think of development as like performance development, but it's not just about that. It's about, it's a shared responsibility and it's a collaborative effort. And for it to truly be, for it to truly be um, successful, we need to have that collaboration. So individuals, they need to take charge of their own development. If you're working on something or if you know you're going to be on a project and maybe you don't feel you have those, maybe you think you need to maybe work on some skills that are going to help you be successful with that. It's your, you need to take charge of that. Bring that up in those one-on-ones, but you can't do that alone. You need the support of your leader. We often, Kate and I, do a program called Six Critical Practices. And we say that a leader needs to tell people the why behind the what, but help them in the how. And the how is the, providing those resources, providing those, those opportunities for development. And that's when you're gonna succeed. And when individuals and managers have a vested interest in that development goal, both share that commitment to see it through. And for leaders, you are the link. I mean, you play that dual role. You need to develop your own skills and abilities, but you also need to be aware of what your team members, um, what people who maybe you're working with on a project, what are their skills? And you're gonna find out those through that ongoing conversations, coaching, feedback. And when we have that, Kind of that that kind of climate where we foster development, then you're going to create an atmosphere of shared responsibility. There's going to be shared successes. Um, you're going to have development insights. You're going to learn from past mistakes. You're going to move forward, and it's going to really be a successful development process. And you're as a leader you need to provide those development insights. So you're in a position to influence, motivate, and guide others based on your experience. And one of the things you can do is to reflect on efforts. So we have in a program we do called Multipliers, we talk about that talking up mistakes um, with your team and doing that. You can talk of, on past efforts, maybe things where you needed to uh, maybe learn a new skill, or maybe you need to work on some tool that you were using. But how did you apply what you learned? Sharing this with your team members. Um, what were the personal and like organizational payoffs? And so, like each one, those leader and the employee have a. They both have an important role, and the leader needs to help that employee target the right development, remove those barriers, and provide that support. So leaders often have access to information maybe that their team might not be aware of, such as maybe changes that are going to be occurring or maybe budgetary constraints or new projects that might require newer different skills, knowledge, or abilities. And it's a shared responsibility. So they need to share the information with their employee or with their team members. And while it is the responsibility of the employer, the team member, is they're much likely to build on new skills and capabilities when the leader is supporting that effort. So for, our, for the employee, they need to commit. Um, they need to enlist support and take action. And there's a so this is kind of what we're going to be talking about, like that high payoff development opportunities, the process, challenges. And then finally, how could you apply this to your own development goals and your own development process? So there's a lot of barriers. I'm not going to go through all of these. But even when people agree that development is really important, 
barriers prevent them from executing their plan. And barriers are going to be inevitable. I mean, we had a pandemic come out of nowhere. I mean, that's was a barrier to a lot of things that I'm sure people had planned going on. And because barriers are inev inevitable, sometimes people let that hinder their development. And when they do, everybody loses out. The organization becomes stagnant because people aren't developing skills and knowledge to succeed. Stagnation, it makes people feel unfulfilled. You feel disengaged. You just, you don't want to go. I mean, it's that 60 minutes clock doing the ticking on Sunday night. And you're like, oh my, I can't believe I have to go tomorrow. So we don't want to have that climate and that atmosphere. And as a result of that, people aren't going to work to their full potential. If this goes unresolved, the organization, it might pay that ultimate price for that by losing talent. Um, people value leaders and organizations that provide those opportunities to grow. We have amazing benefits at UNM, such as tuition remission, um, taking classes with us at EOD. There's the EPEC, 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 EPEC Center at Anderson. There's all these opportunities. There's continuing education. And when people see that the organization values this, then they're going to be there. They're going to be engaged. But when they see that they don't value that, they're going to move elsewhere to get those opportunities. So when people are being developed, they often feel, when I'm sorry, when people aren't being developed, they often feel frustrated, like I said, unfulfilled, disengaged, and you feel like your leader doesn't care. And some of the times these barriers are out of leader's control, but barriers can often prevent people from acquiring those new skills to help meet the goals that they have, to help them be part of new projects. And we need to make sure that we're aware of these barriers and that we can be proactive about them. So for example, that time, no time to attend, to attend training, how can we work with our, with our employees to make that time? Or how can you work with your leader to manage your time so that you are able to do that? On that accountability aspect, we're going to get into that. And also priority shift, but making, making this a priority. And one of the big barriers is that status quo. Well, everything, it's working how it is. Why do we need to change? But if you find that, like some of you said, that maybe people are turning in things later, you're not getting responses to things. Is there maybe a skill set that you could learn? Is there maybe something you could do differently? Maybe there's a new, I know we use Opinio, maybe there's another program that has other features that reminds people to do, I mean, things like that, that we could do. So one way to overcome these barriers is to make sure that each person's goals, their development goals are aligned with that of the team and the organization. And when personal goals are aligned with the group, then development is more likely to occur because that individual, they're going to get support and resources from their manager. There's going to be more work-related opportunities to learn and apply these skills. And there's a greater percentage of chance um, for success when all parties are invested in this opportunity. So we have at the top of our little picture, we have personal goals. So those are the individual's short and long-term personal goals and needs. That's kind of what you would put on your PEP as your goals for the coming year. Um, the group goals, this, maybe your team has their own goals and needs. These are represented by your group goals and needs. And then finally, we have the organization's goals and needs. And when people agree that that development is really important, then they're gonna be able to execute their development plan and have making sure that it's aligned to all three of these. That's why it has like the development star that touches all three of these circles. That's why it has that in the middle. So this is an example of someone um, to better illustrate this of what a high payoff development is. So we have Fiona. Um, Fiona is a customer service representative. She works in her organization and um, she, works on like the helpline handling standard issues and frequently asked questions. Um, they've introduced a new strategic initiative to build customer loyalty. So her personal goal is to help her develop those skills 
to resolve higher level customer issues. And the customer service group also set a department goal to increase customer retention. And so they need to build their team members' capabilities to resolve customer issues. And then that's gonna build retention and in turn is gonna increase loyalty. And, but then they think about where the organization is and her team. And so they identified this high payoff development opportunity, um, learning to handle more challenging customer issues. So she's going to gain these new skills while helping her team and organization achieve this. So this is kind of what it looks like on here. So we have her organization needs. It's a new strategic initiative. Um, she wants to develop her skills to resolve higher level issues. And their goal is they want to decrease the retention by 2%. So when you are setting these development goals, make sure they are in alignment with the group and the organization. So, because if, if they're not in alignment, you're not gonna get buy-in for that support. And we don't know why that did that, but, and if it's in alignment, you're gonna get a lot more support, um, maybe access to resources, access to that time, and it's gonna succeed because everybody's invested in that opportunity. There's gonna be more work-related opportunities to apply those skills. So in other words, work is the way to development. If when you learn a new skill, if you don't use it, I mean, they always say like, use it or lose it, you're gonna lose it. So they have this little kind of process. So we have assess, acquire and apply. And throughout this, there should be that ongoing support, coaching and feedback. So in our, sorry, in our assess phase, we have, Goals are targeted with the highest payoff um, to the person being developed. In acquire, then you act on a plan. And in the apply phase, these practices are being put to use um, what, in real situations. And this is a really critical part of the process because a person, if they can't find a way to use a skill, then they're not gonna use it. So in assess our best practices, our development, it needs to focus on more than just the areas of performance that require go growth. You need to identify strengths as well. So why would, when you think about strengths in a development plan, you're thinking like, why would I wanna focus on strengths um, in creating the plan? Because they already have that strength. But if you can hone in on a strength, you're gonna boost a person's confidence. We have in that multipliers program that I encourage anyone to take at EOD, but in that program, they talk about finding your, like your innate genius. So it's knowing those things you have as a strength and building on that. That's gonna build your confidence. Um, developing a strength can turn an advantage into a really big asset. And maybe you might identify future leaders. You're going to, maybe someone, you didn't think about putting them on a project or you didn't think about putting them on a grant, but they have a strength in a certain area that, is really gonna be helpful. So maybe if someone is a really good communicator, build on that strong commun communication skills. And there you have the person that can present. Um, someone's a really good writer, build on those skills. Maybe they're gonna be the one that's gonna write the grant. And people typically gravitate towards work they do best. We don't wanna do things we don't do well. We don't gravitate towards things we're not gonna be successful in. So we wanna leverage those strengths. They're gonna put more energy into it and they're gonna work at a level that's beyond what they were doing. Also keep the application in mind. Um, make sure that you are, when you're assessing your, what are you assessing it for? And it's kind of remember when we're assessing, we wanna make sure that it is aligned with the personal group and the organizational needs. And when I said that, begin with the application in mind. So people need an immediate opportunity to apply what they've learned. And it needs to be a high payoff opportunity, the one that meets the personal group and organizational goals. And if it's not used, you're gonna lose it. And that's lost time and energy. And people might be like, why did they make us like go to this class? Or why did I go through that program? I don't even get a chance to use it. And if you don't use it right away, it probably wasn't the right development goal in the first place. And then how many things should you develop? Keep it simple. 
keep it a simple plan. Um, maybe one strength and one growth area. Rarely does anyone have time or energy, especially in everything we have going on right now, to develop many areas at the same time. Identifying one strength and one growth is gonna make it manageable and focused and increase the likelihood you're gonna be successful. And then narrowing that focus, that enables development to continue while they're still doing their daily tasks. So if you're like, I'm using Kate for an example, um, Kate went and learned how to use Articulate to help us create really um, vibrant, um, amazing online learning. And we can't have her just doing that. She had to focus on other things as well. So that was like the one goal to create really interactive, vibrant, um, engaging um, online learning for some of the clients we have and some of the things we do at EOD. And, but she was still able to do everything else. So it wasn't so overwhelming to her. And in the process, sometimes people don't see the value in maybe developing a particular skill. Um, maybe they're happy with the status quo. For those of you who have done discs, some styles like an S and C are kind of, if it's not broke, why, like, why do we do anything? So the leader's role is to help people see the benefits to the team, to the organization and themselves. Maybe you've worked with someone who maybe wasn't particularly interested in developing a new skill, learning maybe a new technology, learning, maybe going to get certified in something, but we need to be able to communicate to that employee or that team member how this is really going to help and how a lot of times these skills that we're given at our jobs, these are things that you can take with you. I mean, if you get certified in something, you can use that to do other things. So take advantage of any opportunity that your, that your leader presents to you that's gonna help the group, help you, help the organization. And then our next one is our acquire. So once you know the areas to develop, once you've focused on that, then you're gonna identify how and when to acquire this new skill. If you're focusing on a growth area, you're going to go through all of these phases, the assess, acquire, apply. If you're focusing on a strength, you can, you can kind of go over that acquire phase and go directly to apply. So you'll just go assess to apply. And we're gonna look at some of the best practices for our acquire. So for acquire, Use a combination of learning methods. Leverage opportunities that address more than one need at a time. And almost all development efforts, they require adding or augmenting a new skill, knowledge, ability. And in the acquire phase, you're gonna implement a plan for learning that new skill, knowledge, or ability. Be sure to identify potential barriers, especially if it's like I said, time constraints. Think about how you can shift maybe someone's priorities, their schedule and then define those measures of successful acquisition. And we're gonna get into how measurement is really important. There's a variety of ways to learn something new. Um, the best learning comes from experiential learning, from actually using it, but there are other ways that maybe you haven't thought about. So in our formal learning, this is just kind of classroom or self-study reading seminars maybe learning from others, feedback from mentors, real-time coaching, observation, shared experiences, job shadowing, even networking, learning from your experiences. I'm sure we've all done this one. New job assignments, um, in-place developmental assignments, off-work experiences, cross-functional, those stretch assignments that I'm gonna talk about in a second. Or in some departments I know over like at School of Medicine, they do roundings. So there's like kind of, they move jobs around. So job rotations. And it's important that we think about which one of these is going to be the most successful, what combination of these maybe. And we don't want to, if someone is learning from experience, we don't want it to be like a sink or swim. Um, Kate and I love talking about the brain and that kind of puts your brain in that fight or flight. And we don't wanna be in that. We wanna make sure people, like I said, the why behind the what and help them with the how. When you're giving that new skill, you're helping people with that how. You're giving them 
the, the resources, the tools to be successful. You wanna use a combination in some cases. And in learning, variety is the key. So using a, variety, using a combination of learning methods, it also accommodates the many different ways that people learn. Some people are vision provers um, that have permission to approve in that queue. So you can go check that, that to find out whose queue it is and you know who to contact if, if it's being held up for some reason. Next slide, please. If it's already been approved, um, partially approved or fully approved, you can go to FOIAPPH document approval history and enter the JV number and JV is type. And you can see who has already approved it and the approval dates. And that way, if, again, if you have any questions um, about the approvals, you can know who to contact. Next slide, please. FGIO ENC organizational and conference list is really, really handy if you have an index or you have multiple indices that have a lot of POs on it and you're trying to figure out um, what changes do I need, what's still open, what's not open, this is where you can go. You enter your index number and it will pull up every open encumbrance on that index number. So in this, this example, there are two POs that are open. Um, and on the second one, you can see there's only a dollar left. So now you have the PO number that you can use in order to do a purchase order change and get rid of that dollar because you know you're not going to be invoiced for that dollar. This is very handy at the end of the ward when you, if you um, need to move the PO to another index number, um, it will tell you exactly which POs you need to deal with. If you come up um, on the very bottom line with an encumbrance that says PR, that's payroll. And so those encumbrances, you can get the detail from that, from your payroll, uh, my reports that are out there. Next, please. Once you have a PO, if you want more detail, you can go to FGIENCD, the detail encumbrance activity, and you can enter the PO number there, and it will give you different information. For example, it will tell you in the left-hand side, there's a status O for open, C for close. Uh, on the right-hand side towards the bottom, you can see the encumbrance, how much was encumbered on that PO, the liquidation, including invoices that have gone to that PO, and the balance that's remaining. Next slide, please. It also gives you actual line by line detail of everything that happened with that PO. So this one was pretty long. So I just pulled uh, beginning, middle and the very end information. So the very first line, you can see the type is P-O-R-D. That's the original purchase order. And you can see that the original purchase order was for 48,750. Then all the types that were our I-N-E-I, those are the invoices that actually went against the purchase order. And then CORD, those were change orders that were made as they increase the purchase order amounts. And then the very bottom line was the last invoice that was paid. And you can see that the balance of, of the 56,000 matches the previous screen that we had seen. So again, those are two great screens to use to find out what's going on on your index, what POs are still open, and to get more detail on those POs. Next screen, please. Some inquiry screens that you can do in Banner uh, is the first one is FTI FADA, the Attribute Association Query. Um, and you can use this in a couple different ways. For example, if you have a fund and you say, I want to know what the over expenditure index is for that fund, you can enter the fund code and then it will bring up that information and tell you what the index number is. More importantly for the department use is if you have an unrestricted index that you want to close and you need to know the funds that are related to that because you can't close an unrestricted index if it's an over expenditure index number for a fund, you can actually go into FTI FADA and enter the index number under attribute value, and it will pull up a whole list of the funds that are related that have that as the over expenditure index. And then you can send that list, you know what funds to send to your fiscal monitor so that they can go in and change the over expenditure index to another index number so you can close it. Next screen. Uh, a grant personnel inquiry, FRIPSTG. 
you can go in there and enter the banner ID of a PI and it will list all the grants that that PI has had in banner. And from there you can sort it. So like if you want to see the maximum amounts, you want to see which what, what was their top three uh, grants that they had, you can also filter it. For example, um, if you only want active awards, you can go in and filter it by status so you only have the A's for active. Uh, one caveat on this, this is whoever was the um, whatever grants this person was on in the personnel tab in Fragrant. So if you have someone, a PI who is also a chair or a director, it will pull up those grants um, that is where they were uh, a chair or director for. So it doesn't work too much for those few PIs, but for your, most of your PIs who haven't been chairs or directors, it's very handy just so you can see exactly what grants that they have had. Next slide. On billing, occasionally, uh, mainly with private industry, small private companies that give us funding, uh, a PI will want to know, has it been paid or not? An FRI bill, the grant billing inquiry, is handy for that because it will list out all the invoices and amounts, what's been paid and what's been outstanding. So in this particular example, there were three invoices. The first invoice has been paid, but invoices two and three have not been paid. Again, mainly this is used for those private industry awards, and there's a concern that we're not going to be paid, and um, pretty rare. But if you ever asked about this, now you know what screen you can use. Next, please. So those are some extra banner screens. And on my reports, I'm just going to go through some of the scheduling as Rebecca gave you the link and mentioned. This is very handy where you can schedule reports that they can come out when you want them uh, and go to whomever you want to send them to. So the first thing you do is you have to set your parameters of whatever you would normally run on that report. In this particular case, I'm working with the, the um, the executive report, also sometimes known as the burn rate report. Um, we used to have a burst report for the um, for the burn rate report, but uh, we asked FSM to quit running it because there were some issues with their sending it. So if you are very interested in that and having that sent to your PIs, this is what you can do is you can schedule it. So you pick your parameters on this particular case, you can pick it by PI ID, um, you want active funds only, and for your reporting period and calendar year, you want to pick either prior month or um, uh, current month, because if you pick a specific month, for example, if you say April, the, and you want it to run monthly, every month it will run only April's report. So that's why you want either prior or current month on that. And what does the burn rate report do? It actually gives a list of all the um, um, P, uh, the PI's awards that is, uh, like I said, if they're active, it will tell you what the budget is, what was spent, and the burn rate itself, the percentage, um, is a comparison between the time on the award and the amount spent on the award. The closer to zero, the closer that time and money is being spent equitably, the better it is. But this way you can see, um, is it being overspent for the time? Is it being underspent? That's what the report is for. And generally we say if it's over 50%, just take a look at it and see what's going on. Uh, next slide, please. Once you hit schedule, it will take you into a distribution tab of the scheduling um, portal. And from there, you enter who you want it to go to. So if you want it to go to a specific PI, you would enter the PI's email address. And you can also copy yourself or anyone else. When I write up reports to go to someone, I generally copy myself so that I will get the report also. Um, on the subject line, it defaults to, to the, um, the you know, to FRRCGES, whatever the my report um, letters are. And so I will add to the subject line what I'm sending. Is it the fund list? Is it the GL detail for the month? Is it a burn rate report? I will add that to the subject line so that whoever the recipient is, they'll know what it is um, when it comes through. Next slide, please. 
From the distribution tab, I go over to recurrence and that's where you choose how often do you want it and when do you want it? Do you want it weekly on every Monday? Do you want it monthly on the 10th of the month? Um, you choose what exactly, you know, when and uh, you want it to come out and how often. If you want it monthly for monthly reports, just remember, um, generally our month end closes, it's more by working days. So I always use just the 10th. Uh, next slide, please. The other tab that's really, really important, um, you have the distribution tab and the recurrence tab is the uh, notification tab. Um, and that's because uh, notifications will tell you if there's an error to the report and you want to know that if something happened where it didn't run you want to know what that so you can go in and look and see why not so on this one the reply address and the brief message too is your email and then i just add error to the subject line and that immediately tells me when the email comes through that there was an issue with this report next slide then you save it and you save it, it goes into your My Content folder in My Reports. You can have multiple folders under that. As you can see, I use a lot of different My Reports. Um, and so like I have a monthly reports where I would save it for the monthly reports that I have scheduled to go out to different people. And you can name it what you want. So if it was the burn rate port report, you can say um, burn rate um, for Dr. Smith you know, whatever you want to title it. And that way, if you want to go back and edit it or you want to delete it, perhaps the PI, perhaps it's a report you no longer need, you can go into your My Content folder and go ahead and delete it from there. Um, if the rate for the burn rate, the question is, if it's greater than 50%, it needs attention or less than a minus 50. That's when you should just take a look at it and say, okay, are we underspending or overspending? And this is something to look at. Um, in an earlier um, um, presentation uh, and audit, they talked about how uh, a lot of the, the agencies look at, are you spending as you're supposed to be spending? And if you're drastically underspending, um, they will say, well, why? you know, do you, do you need all this money then? And that can affect future funding. If you're overspending, you wanna make sure that um, it's looked at so that, um, you know, you don't wanna run out of money before the end of the award. So that's why the burn rate is important for those, those two reasons. Um, next slide. And that's the end of our presentation. Uh, does anybody have any additional questions for for Rebecca or Anja or me on dashboard, um, um, the uh, ad hoc bills or banner and my reports? I will tell you that I used the dashboard for the first time uh, about a month ago um, because normally I'm uh, wanting post-award information and I needed some pre-award information about a certain federal agency and the funding they gave us. And it was very simple to use. I'd never used it before, but I was able to go out and figure it out. And as Rebecca mentioned, you know, you can click on a bar on the graph and it will drill down and give you additional information. Hi, hey, Teresa, I know um, uh, Makila had, uh, I'm sorry, Makiela had uh, a question in regards to the burn rate. And her initial question was, um, was what does a burn rate report do? And I know Andra kind of um, uh, chimed in to see if she had, um, if you had answered her question during your presentation, but she is curious to know uh, what the burn rate report does. Right, um, I, I did see that. Um, basically, it just tells you, are you under or overspending in a very simple manner, overspending or underspending on your award based on the time uh, of the award. 
And There's Rebecca, a... do you see the question regarding what happens to the dashboard when we switch over to Streamline? Well, that's uh, that's that, that's a good question. Uh, we're not too sure, uh, or should I say, I'm not too sure what will happen to the dashboard, considering that the dashboard draws information from CAIUS, which is definitely the proposal and award, which we no longer will have, right? Banner will still be in existence. Uh, so you will see the research and the FNA cost recovery. Um, that uh, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we will have to wait to see what would happen with that other part of the information. But obviously, it's going to have to go ahead and now be extracted from Streamline. Whether we continue to do the uh, continue to use the dashboard, that uh, that will uh, remain to be seen. Um, I happen to be on one of the um, in the meetings involving Streamline, and there's uh, two things. Is number one, we're hoping that they will have far more reports that can be used by the departments than Cayuse does. Cayuse is very, very limited. Um, so that's what we're hoping is that we'll have a lot of reports that will be automatic. Um, and then we also are wanting to integrate with Banner. So we're we're thinking that. Um, Yes, we're, we're going to lose the dashboard information with Cayuse, but we're hoping that we will still end up with some kind of alternative. Teresa, I think that's correct. I think that there's a lot more reporting that they um, demoed. And I guess as these next 12 months unfold, that's what we'll find out about. All right, so thank you all. I'm sure you're seeing that our breakout rooms will close in 40 some seconds now. So thank you all for attending. And I know if you have any questions, I'm happy for you to reach out to me and I'm sure Rebecca and Teresa feel the same. Thank you all. It was great. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye.